All rise. The Court of Appeals <coughs> Division One is now in session. You may be seated. Good morning. We're here today for oral argument in the case of Angels Cremation and Burial LLC versus the State of Arizona Board of Funeral Directors and Embalmers, 1 CA CV 18 0439. Um, each side has been allocated 20 minutes. We leave it up to you guys to keep track of your own time. If you want to reserve any time, let us know, but that'll be up to you to uh, keep track of it yourself. Um, please be advised that this uh, oral argument will be recorded and posted to YouTube. So when you approach the podium, uh, please state your name and who you represent so that if anybody wants to watch online for any reason, they will know who's representing whom. Um, is there anything I've left off? I can't think of anything. Well established. Yes. All right. If you uh, would be so kind, you may begin. May it please the court, my name is Charles Burry. I represent the appellant, Angels Cremation and Burial. I'd like to reserve three or four minutes of my time, if I may, uh, for rebuttal. Angels is challenging the constitutionality of two rules that the funeral board relied upon when it disciplined Angels for stacking containers holding human remains. Those two rules are 4-12-301A1 and A5. The second of the two, A5, prohibits activities which foreseeably could result in needless infliction of emotional distress on members of a decedent's family or result in exposing human remains to unnecessary indignity. This rule suffers from the same infirmities as the rules struck down by the courts in Tucson Women's Clinic versus Eden and Women's Medical Center of Northwest Houston versus Bell. We have entire doctrines uh, of common law designed to prevent emotional distress. Are they unconstitutionally vague as well? That is a determination for the, the jury to make. No, constitutionality is never a determination for the jury to make. Well, factually I'm speaking. If the claim is broad. Right, but I'm asking about constitution. You're making a challenge to the rule. You're saying the rule is invalid. So are <laughs> our common law doctrines of negligent infliction of emotional distress uh, similarly invalid because they're too vague? Your Honor, I'm not prepared to, to address that issue, frankly. Okay. I'd have to take a look at them and uh, give it some thought. Uh, we're here to discuss the, the rules adopted by the funeral board, and I would submit that if this rule, this 301A5, is judged using the same standards that the courts used in the Tucson Women's Clinic and the Women's Medical Center of Northwest Houston used, the court will see that the rule is unconstitutional. It has three constitutional infirmities. Um, first, it subjects licensees to sanctions based not on their own objective behavior, but on the subjective viewpoints of others. Isn't all of our maybe I, I don't want to speak that broadly, but isn't much of our um, regulation of professions, both the legal profession, the medical profession, and apparently the, the funeral profession, based upon the concept of what is the accepted practice in the community or in, the, in that profession? I, I don't see how the distinction you're trying to make between saying you can't, we can't in advance write up every little nook and cranny, but if you're doing something that everybody else in the in this profession says is wrong, it's wrong. Tell me where, where the distinction you're trying to make is. Well, the distinction is in the rule itself. Some rules say, okay, you can't do uh, anything that isn't in accord with the prevailing standards and practices of the profession. This rule that we're talking about says something different. It says you can't do anything that could foreseeably result in needless infliction of emotional distress. Well, okay, let, let me posit then <clears throat> that the, your client was more transparent and a recently bereaved family comes in and they explain, we're going to place your loved one in a cardboard box and stack that box with, with others. Um, you're okay with that? How many customers do you think would not feel emotional distress at 
such a suggestion? Your Honor, I could only engage in surmise, but I can tell you we've had testimony. I could engage in the same surmise, though. And, and, and it's difficult for me to imagine anyone with full disclosure of the facts saying, yeah, that sounds good. How much do I owe you? I can tell you we had testimony from Sandy Greenlee, the owner of Angel's Cremation and Burial, and she testified that she had discussions with members of the decedent's family about this very thing. How would you feel about the, the container holding your uh, decedent's uh, remains being stacked with, with others? Most said it didn't trouble them. And I think that's the problem. I mean, some people would say, yes, fine. It doesn't make any difference to me. The individual is dead. We're just talking about innate remains. Others would say, no, I take deep umbrage at that. Uh, this person is special, and I wanted the and remains we treated as special. That others would say, I take deep umbrage with that. Isn't that foreseeable emotional distress? It could be. It, so it could be. But again, it's a question. It's so subjective. It's so vague. You may feel one way. I may feel another. But to judge someone's behavior after the fact on what you believe to be acceptable well, or unacceptable. No, I, I, don't, I don't think it would be unfortunate if you came away with the idea that the standard, I was proposing some standard based on my subjective impression. I think the standard is foreseeable harm. So if you have a significant segment of the population that could be foreseeably distressed, that violates the regulation. In other words, the regulation tips the balance in favor of the most sensitivity, perhaps even where that sensitivity isn't required. Well, I don't think foreseeability uh, saves this rule. I think the real issue is what do the, does the phrase needless infliction of emotional distress mean? What does unnecessary indignity mean? Again, people have different ideas as to what those concepts entail, and they vary widely. Well, that's true, but, but, but then what standard does that lead you to? Well, the standard should be simply this. Uh, if it comports with the prevailing standards and practices of the, the profession, okay. And here it's okay. Have, and if it doesn't, it... And it, here there's it, evidence in the record that this practice does not comport. It, that, that evidence may not be uniform or undisputed, but a finding was made that there was sufficient evidence to say this practice violates the standards of the profession. And we don't take exception with it. That's Rule 4-12-301A2, and we're not challenging that finding. What we're challenging is the board's reliance on these other two rules, which incorporate these amorphous concepts, and, and to judge someone by these amorphous concepts is just unfair. It's unconstitutional. And, and again, you go back to the fact that, you know, you don't have objective behavior. For example, if there was a rule that said that stacking was improper, well, then you can, you can measure um, Angel's behavior against that standard. They, they, they stacked. They violated the rule. But to say that stacking constitutes something that results in needless infliction of emotional distress or exposes remains to unnecessary indignity is, is just, well, it, it, it's well, hard for the, the licensee to know what is being, what the standard is that they're being gauged against. I, uh, <clears throat> I raised with you the common law uh, tort doctrines around emotional distress, but let, let's pull up a uh, Supreme Court rule and uh, see, see how you feel about uh, <clears throat> Rule 8.4 of the Rules Governing Attorneys. Uh, and, and I will read it to you here in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> but, but it contains a rather um, vague general catch-all definition of misconduct um, that goes like this. Uh, it's professional misconduct for a, a lawyer um, <clears throat> to engage in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. Is that unconstitutional? 
Off the top of my head, I can't answer that. I don't know that it's ever been challenged. Well, I don't, I don't think it has. But my, my point is there are, there are vague terms in a lot of statutes and a lot of rules, and, and vagueness can be a useful drafting technique when the object, as Judge Morse pointed out, is to capture a class of conduct. I think we could agree that that principle is not itself unconstitutional. I would agree with you. I mean, we get back to the idea there's a standard of care in medicine. You know, there are acceptable practices in the practice of law. Uh, and, and to judge someone using those standards would not be unconstitutional. But again, when you drag in terms like the, the uh, foreseeability of needless infliction of emotional distress or unnecessary indignity. I mean, it just doesn't provide a guide by which, you know, a court or a jury can, can measure conduct. So, so just so I'm clear, you're only challenging then the violation of 301, I think, 5. 1 and 5. But 301.1 does have a prevailing standards and practices of the profession in the state element. It, it does. Built in. It, so, it does. But keep keep this in mind. Although it's there, I don't think it saves the rule. And I say this because... How, how, how so? Because that seems contrary to everything you've been arguing up to this point. No, I'm, I'm saying if you look at 301A2, we don't, we don't quibble with that. We quibble with, with 301A1. The, the fact that it has that qualifying language in there doesn't change anything because if the court is going, or excuse me, if the board is going to, to use that rule to judge a licensee's conduct, they can't avoid making a decision whether or not the conduct uh, showed disrespect for the deceased. There's no way to get around that. Just being contrary to prevailing standards and practices isn't enough. No, I, as I read it, it says conduct that it shows disrespect for the deceased person, so somewhat subjective, but then only conduct that shows this subjective disrespect that is contrary to established practices uh, or prevailing standards and practices of the profession. But the language disrespect for the deceased really becomes superfluous. If you make the determination that the, the conduct at issue doesn't comport with prevailing practices and standards of the profession, why go beyond that? There is absolutely no need it, to it engage in this. If anything, design. it helped your client as opposed to hurt them. They, it, you would say it's fine to have a rule that says anything contrary to prevailing practices is sanctionable. And what they've done is said, we're going to narrow that. So not just conduct that is contrary to prevailing practices, but that also provides disrespect. How can that additional benefit be to your client's disadvantage? Well, basically, the board has done that. If you look at 301A2, it, it says that uh, if you uh, engage in practices that don't comport with the duty to exercise care and competence in handling human remains in accordance with prevailing practices and standards, uh, th that's unprofessional conduct. So that's there. Well, but there may be other deviations from the normal standards of the profession that involve no disrespect to the decedent or, or the family that would, that would leave a party undisciplined under this rule. That, that sh I would think you'd think that was a good thing. I, I, I disagree with you. I'm assuming that if people thought it was wrong to, to, to stack, that they'd have a rule that would say it's wrong to stack. I mean, it's as simple as that. And it could be wrong because of health and safety concerns, or it could be wrong well, for you, other reasons. You could, imagine, you could imagine probably if you sat around for a few hours, you'd probably come up with a list of 500 things that might be perceived as disrespectful. Right? And we wouldn't want a rule that has 500 subparts. No, and that, that's not necessary. But again, why get back to judging people on what constitutes disrespect or what constitutes an indignity. Yeah, but we're not con judging people on what constitutes disrespect. We're judging people on what constitutes disrespect that is contrary to prevailing norms in this profession. And but, that could foreseeably cause emotional distress to another person. I would submit, if you find that the conduct is contrary to prevailing standards and practices in the profession, you should be done. Why throw in this? But how does that help? Let's say we agree with you on that legal point. Don't we have evidence that your client violated the standards of the profession? How does that change the result? Well, 
the, the, then you go back to, okay, the, the finding that 301A2 was violated justifies discipline. And, and my, my, my submission would be, okay, you've, the board had but one rule violated, not three, and so the matter ought to be remanded to the board for reconsideration as to what disciplinary action would be appropriate for violation of a singular rule as opposed to three rules. So just so we're clear, though, you are no longer challenging the violation as to 301A2. You are still maintaining that 301, the 301A1 and 301.5 are improper. That is correct. We never challenged uh, okay. uh, A2. Uh, and, and again, uh, not to uh, to beat a, a dead horse, but I, I think if you look at these, I don't know if that's the appropriate <laughs> <metaphor> in this <laughs> case. But again, if you uh, if you uh, look at these two rules and you judge them against the the standards utilized in the two previous cases that I cited, the Bell and the the Eden cases, I think it becomes clear they don't pass constitutional muster. So, so in other words, you think these rules are facially unconstitutional, and no action could violate. I mean, we could imagine really exotic uh, means of public disrespect and humiliation, and you would say those are those are not redressable under the current code because the rules unconstitutional. Correct. Correct. With that, I'd like to reserve the rest of my time unless the the court has other questions. No, nope. we will reserve that time. Thank you. Good morning, members of the court. Uh, Thomas, Assistant Attorney General Thomas Rain, appearing on behalf of the Arizona State Board of Funeral Directors and Embalmers. Um, Your Honor, we, we believe that the, this case was uh, fully briefed. Pretty, our position is pretty clear here. Um, so I'm ready for any questions you may have. But ultimately, we believe that this uh, case is governed by the Golub decision, in which this court um, upheld a uh, what would a professional standard that could be at least theoretically as vague as A1 and A5 here. And, and what the court said in Golub is, is instructive. So the standard in Golub versus uh, the medical board was, find it here. There we go. Any conduct or practice that is or might be harmful or dangerous to the health of the patient or the public. That was challenged by a doctor as being uh, facially uh, unconstitutional due to vagueness. And, and the court stated, uh, surely the legislature intended rather to prescribe only those forms of treatment whose potential or actual harm is unreasonable under the circumstances given the applicable standard of care. And further quoting, finding such a requirement implicit in any sensible reading of the statute, we reject the argument that the statute is unconstitutionally vague. Uh, we don't even need to find anything implicit in the statute because it explicitly 301A1 contains that it only disciplines people for disrespectful conduct that is contrary to the prevailing standards and practices of the profession in this state. So that, that's an explicit limitation on that disrespect uh, prong. And I agree with that, as the court was uh, asking uh, Angel's about that, Angel's argument that the disrespect is now superfluous just because it's couched in the standards of the prevailing standards of the profession. We disagree with that. Rather, the disrespect prong limits what you can discipline under that on 301A5 or A1. So you can only discipline someone, even if they violated the standards of care, only if it was in such a manner as to be disrespectful. And as we sh showed in our brief, there were seven different licensed funeral directors testified that this is, falls way below the standard of care in the industry, that essentially they were appalled by the practice. Um, 301A5 also contains an objective standard by which the licensee's conduct can be measured. And the key, language, the key word in 301A5 is foreseeable. So you cannot discipline someone based only upon a family member's subjective impression that the funeral director's conduct or the funeral home's conduct uh, caused emotional distress. It's only if that conduct <coughs> would foreseeably cause emotional distress. And in this case, I believe four different funeral directors testified that based upon their experience in the, in the, in the industry, a, a family member would be foresee would foreseeably have emotional course, distress. There are problems with that at the, at the edges, at least, right? Because it, it might be foreseeable that 1% customers might find some otherwise innocuous practice offensive for some unknown cultural or religious reason, for example. 
and, and because because that reason is unknown, the practice continues. Would, would, would you think this rule would allow discipline on that ground? I think the protection that this rule provides is that that foreseeability and, and first of all, I think that 301A, 301A is a singular rule, and I think they should be read in part of material such that the professional standards should always be required, you know, to be established in this. But in, in, you're asking about the Wait, situation uh, where it's a small percent. Oh, go ahead. I'm no, asking you, about, you, you, let, let's say there's a group of people whose uh, <coughs> deeply held beliefs suggest that a decedent should always be uh, oriented with their head pointing north. Okay. And if you don't do that, it's disrespect. Now, most of us wouldn't be aware of that belief. Uh, most of us wouldn't care about north, south, east, or west. But some people do. It's a small group. But it's foreseeable that they'd be upset if that happened. Would you, would you foresee discipline under those circumstances? I would say it would depend on what the expert testimony uh, holds. Because even in Gallup, they say, the legislature intended rather to prescribe only those forms of treatment whose potential actual harm is unreasonable under the circumstances given the standard of care. So I think that that would be something the expert witnesses would testify to. Is it reasonable that, that, a, that a practitioner in this field would, would know that or would anticipate that? So it's really about what, the, what is the standard of care in the industry, and if the standard, if everybody gets training on that, then the North Facing Group, and they, and they should know that, they may be disciplinary. It may be something that you could have discipline for, but if it's something that it wouldn't be everybody reasonable Everybody get to. training on, on this stacking practice? I don't know about everybody, but there was testimony from Dr. Thomas Taggart, who was the, uh, the dean of the, the only mortuary school in Arizona, which has been operating since the 70s. So I think there was testimony that some large percentage of practitioners in the state went through his program. And he testified that, um, in, well, first of all, they teach it in the school. It's in the textbooks. And he testified that in every, every, any, any sort of written format he could find anything on stacking was, it's always prohibited. So there was substantial testimony that this is taught from day one in, in mortuary school. Not to mention there was testimony from the various trade groups, CANA, which was the uh, Cremation Association of North America. They testified that you shouldn't stack. There was also the ICCFA, which is the International Crematory Funeral. Um, Wasn't there also testimony that uh, the appellant um, said something along the lines, I'll take the heat for it, and indicating that she knew it was improper? Yes. Well, the testimony, the factual testimony was that um, Angel's, the Angel's owner, who was, who, who the testimony was that she did not have formal education in, in, in funeral practices. She just owned it. There was testimony that her responsible funeral director had brought up the issue and said, don't stack, and that the owner said, I'll take the heat for it. And ultimately, the responsible funeral director quit because the owner was continuing to tell the employees to stack after she went home for the day. And not only did the responsible funeral director quit over this practice, the intern, Michael Vasquez, who was interning after graduating from funeral college, you have to do a one-year internship, he quit his internship a few months early because he also didn't want to be tied to this practice. So this, the owner in this case had ample information that this practice was, was prohibited. She just said, I'll take the heat for it, and, and was insisting that because it wasn't written down explicitly that she could continue doing it. Let me ask you a question. Your reference to Golub, and in, in I think twice during your yes. your discussion with Judge Swan, you you talked about um, the standard of, of care or, or the the standard in the in the profession. Are you is your position that three hundred one five is saved, but only saved under Golub because we impliedly read in in violation of standard of care or standard of the profession? No, I don't think. I, I think that it's even without using the Golub, the, the, the implied reading. It's the foreseeable, the foreseeability analysis that, that that saves it from being a purely subjective situation, like the ones mentioned in those the two abortion cases. So even under under 301A5, again, they can only be disciplined if it's foreseeable. So just because a family member comes in and says this was emotionally stressful to me and it was okay, traumatic, so it wasn't foreseeable that it would be emotionally stressed. So then we have to go through a reasonable person. And the reason that it's foreseeable in this case is because it's violation of the standard in the profession, that, or that that's how you establish foreseeability because everyone's trained not to do this. That's correct. Foreseeability is not defined through more individual evidence of what, what people might find distressful? Um, not in this case. I mean, I mean, in a tort case, I think you're right, although even then it's well, – I, I don't want to speak to the torts. But, but, but I, I think we're making two sides of the argument, though, yes. because in this case you're saying that the distress is, uh, and the disrespect is a limiting factor, um, 
narrowing the classes of breaches of professional standard that can be disciplined, right? Yes. But you're also saying that we determine the foreseeability of uh, distress by reference to those same standards which the distress is supposed to limit. So don't we need two sources of evidence? One is what the standards are, and one is what people might foreseeably be distressed by. Uh, I hope I understand the question. I think, I think it's our position that well, can you, can you, could you say it again, Judge Long? I'm sorry. <clears throat> sure. It, when, we, when we speak about uh, people being foreseeably placed uh, in emotional distress, yes. necessary emotional distress, surely we can look to factors outside whatever the professional standards uh, of, of the industry are and, and look at what people's reaction might be uh, even to... to practices that comply with those standards. I'm not saying that you could be disciplined for that because you need both prongs. You need a violation of standards and foreseeable harm. But it doesn't seem like the evidence of a violation of standard can also prove foreseeable harm because then you would have a superfluous to term in the rule. I think I could give you an example maybe that might cover it. Please. So let's say the standard of care is that you, you never care about the north, south, east, west. But the family comes to the funeral director as part of the initial intake, I presume, and says, this matters a lot to us. Please keep, and they agree to do it. And then later we learn that they, they, they walk in a back door and see the body facing south. Would that be something that, in this case, even though it didn't violate a standard of care because that's not something they knew about because it was foreseeable to these, the family of this decedent and the director acknowledged it and agreed to do it, that that could be a violation of 315? I think potentially it could be. Um, that wasn't the facts here, but I think even within, even that though, I think that could still be brought around to the uh, standard of care because part of the standard of care is for these, and, and that there's a lot of testimony on this, that, that respect and, and making sure the family is not overly burdened is a critical part of this industry. And I think, I'm sure the testimony would be uh, on standard of care is that practitioners should communicate with the, with the customers, with the families, and, and find out if there are any particular idiosyncrasies or, or, or concerns, and they should address those. And so, if, oh. so if a practitioner um, did, as Mr. Berg suggested, and communicated with the customer, and they said, oh, yeah, stacking's fine with us, would that be okay then? That might be fine under 301A5 because it, they no longer would foresee that it would be traumatic because the customer said it was okay, but it was still, stacking was still found to be violation of uh, 301A2, which is ca competently caring for the body. That was more of on a, uh, the, the body could leak and whatnot, but, you know, it may still be a violation of A1 as a disrespectful thing contrary to prevailing standards. I don't know whether the board would ultimately discipline someone in that scenario, but I, I think theoretically it could it could be okay under A5 and still be a problem under A1. And I want to make one other point about uh, the issue of particular, uh, if a customer has particular requirements, there is another, I can f find in my rule book, there is another sub rule addressing particular requirements of a, of a family where, where they're supposed to be cognizant of that. So these, this th rule 412, 301 doesn't cover every possible situation for sure. The court didn't really get in or ask questions of, of Mr. Burry about the two abortion cases, but I just wanted to to distinguish them really based upon the fact that the standards in those cases, and I think the uh, the Fifth Circuit case had a lot more uh, detailed analysis, but the real concern of the Fifth Circuit in those cases was that it subjected licensees to discipline based solely upon the subjective impressions of the uh, the patients here, and it obviously had a very high standard for the for the licensees to meet, but. The court commented in there that the big concern is that a licensee could be subject to a different standard of care depending on which patient he or she had. And that was a concern because how do you guide your conduct if the standard of care differs by patients? But isn't that the same argument we're discussing here? And, and the one you just mentioned about, about uh, customers who, who might have differing levels of sensitivity. I, th I think you, you acknowledge that an A5 violation might not occur if a, if a family member gave consent to a certain practice. So isn't that sort of the same as the Fifth Circuit case? Well, I think I think the reason I the reason I say that it might not matter if, if a person gave consent to the uh, process is because because I think that then ties back to the professional standards of 
doing everything they can to ensure that the family member is not unduly traumatized by the experience. So certainly you would be within your professional standards if a family member said, no, that's okay if we do it like this. Okay. Um, there any, you, are there any further questions? No. Okay, thank you. I appreciate thank your you. time. Thank you. Just a few points, if I may. The question was asked about the facts regarding this case, whether Ms. Greenlee knew that stacking was contrary to rules, regulations, or policy. The, the fact was, Ms. Greenlee testified she didn't know that it was contrary to board rule, regulation, or policy. The board had never taken a position on stacking before. She had employees leaving them. It they, couldn't have been a complete surprise. There was, there was, the issue was out there. I guess informally it had circulated through the profession that perhaps the board would not condone stacking, but the board had never taken a formal position on it. Ms. Greenlee said, listen, I don't believe it's improper. She's a very religious person. She didn't believe it was improper, and she told her... Uh, well, religious people can disagree on what's proper. Exactly. And so that's why you need a better standard by which to judge these matters. But then why don't we throw out the entire doctrine of negligence, which just hinges on this amorphous concept of reasonableness? Reasonableness under the circumstances. Yeah. I mean, is that any different from what we're talking about here? Well, then again, you know, we get back, we get back to the idea that, listen, we're talking about, in this case, prevailing standards and practices of the profession. In medicine, we're talking about the standard of care. Isn't that really what we need to measure or use to measure conduct? Well, in medicine, I mean, that's, that's a dangerous slippery slope because under Arizona law in medicine, uh, the standard of care is defined at trial, years after the practice in question, and can vary from case to case. As, as, as and, and nothing about the, the tort of medical negligence has ever been held unconstitutional, yet uh, what may be the standard of care in one case could be different in another case for the same doctor based on different juries. Could be. And had, had there been more than one board, there could have been a different result in this case. Here's the, the problem with this whole setup. Mrs. Greenlee says, listen, I don't believe it's improper. The funeral director says, I, 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 I don't like it. I don't want to do it. You've got this difference of opinion. And so then you've got this amorphous standard out there, and really what it becomes is just a trap for the, the individual who's mistaken. It allows for arbitrary enforcement, and you don't want that in this regulatory context. I mean, what you want to do is, again, I hark back to, to uh, the, the practice of medicine. Uh, the Golab case was, was cited. Yeah, you, know, you have the, uh, the definition of all professional conduct that says you can't do anything that, that does or may prove harmful or dangerous to the patient or the public, but the court went back and said, okay, we're going to use the standard of care to but define what that means. What's the standard of care? Standard of care was what a, what a reasonable, prudent physician would have done in the same or similar circumstances in the state of Arizona. Okay, that's a description of the standard of care. The content of the standard of care is determined differently in every single case. Well, it's, it's, it's a fact question for the jury to decide. And again, it's it's judged. Here, the fact finder decided it. But the, the the standard is objective behavior. You did the surgery when the surgery shouldn't have been done. Not that well, you you, you, you did something you, that was disrespectful to the patient. Do you think, it, as an objective matter, it is unforeseeable that somebody might be offended um, or placed in emotional distress by this practice? Is it possible? No, I asked if it's unforeseeable. <laughs> Perhaps not unforeseeable. Okay, so it's foreseeable that a segment of the population might be offended by this. But when you say this, what is this? Stacking. Well, what is this stacking constitute the needless infliction of emotional distress? Well, does it's it constitute foreseeable that it would to some people? I think we've just agreed on that. Does it does it demonstrate unnecessary indignity? I mean, again, you, everyone's going to have a difference of opinion using the standards incorporated into these rules. And that what, that's what makes these rules so fraught with danger for licensees. It's so amorphous. You don't know what you're dealing with. You don't know how to behave in order to comply. That's the problem. Which is part and parcel of all of the licensing requirements for almost every profession. 
Well, unless, again, we talk about objective behavior, I think that is uh, an easier standard to understand and, and to apply. But isn't there an element of objective behavior based on foreseeability? I don't believe so. Any further questions? All right. Thank you very much for your arguments and presentation day today. Um, we will take this matter under advisement and issue a written decision in due course. We stand at recess. <laughs>